minor prophet, Haggai, talk to us about not giving up and making sure that we are moving forward, even in difficult days. And, and in particular for Haggai it was, let's rebuild the temple. And so they did. And you remember he had to keep, continue to encourage them. Well, they stayed with it. And by the time of Malachi, another minor prophet, they have rebuilt the temple and they've kind of gotten back into some uh, normal sense of life. Uh, and they are living life now as people who aren't quite as powerful as they used to be, but things have settled down. But there's a problem. In Malachi's whole book, it's not very many chapters, I encourage you to read it, gets at this difficulty. As we said, life, they got the temple built, they sort of got everything back in place, life back to normal, and as tends to be sometimes, when things are sort of just going along as usual, they were beginning to forget God. The people in Malachi's day, God had faded somewhat into the background. He wasn't the center of their lives. And as you begin to read all of Malachi, people begin to go, ah, God's okay. God doesn't need us to, to attend to God like we did before. And so around temple worship, where you were supposed to bring the best, the first, the most, ex the most wonderful gift you could bring, People started bringing three-legged calves, diseased animals. They would take the best and the first, and whatever was left, they would give to God. They began to ask themselves, what good is church if there is no immediate visible payoff? I mean, when we were worshiping God before in the temple, we were king of the hill. We were top dogs. Now we're just run of the mill. So maybe this religious stuff really doesn't pay off. We'll just kind of go through the motions. You see, church had become consumer-oriented. What's in it for me? And God was not pleased. And this is Malachi. In fact, he kind of begins to say at times, be careful who you are messing with. But he consistently reminds them this is a big God, a God of the covenant. And so God will never give up on his people, Malachi says. And he says even in verse 6, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, have not perished. I have not wiped you off of the face of the earth yet because my heart is different. So unwilling to give up on Israel but unable to condone their impurity and their injustice, God himself will cleanse them. And now, says Malachi, God is coming. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, surely it's good. God is coming. How wonderful it will be to be in the loving arms of God forever. But oh no, God is coming. How terrible it will be. When God finds me not loving my neighbor as I should, not tending the earth as I ought, not caring for the least of these, God is coming, let me find a place to hide. And so Malachi is saying, folks, you can't get away with this forever. God's going to come. And God's going to do some things. And Malachi uses two images to help us understand this experience. One is... The refiner's fire. My dad, well, my dad's, my dad was a rock hound. He collected rocks and minerals and all kinds of stuff and went with him to a lot of places. His brother, for a while, lived in Colorado and had a gold mine. Woohoo! Yeah, we're, we may have got enough to dust our hand out of that. But we went out there one time and, and uh, went up to the mine and, and looked around. But always, my dad was always talking about rocks and minerals. And so I, I remember uh, watching some videos and, and, and reading some stuff about how they get the precious uh, minerals, gold and silver, out of the ores and the rocks that they're in. 
It's a very uh, delicate process um, in which they sit with whatever form it is in and typically by the time the refiner gets it, it's in a sort of a powdery form or maybe some, some malleable solid. But then they take that flame and they begin to work it. Watch one just recently again that reminded me of is how delicate and how important it is that that refiner, and you noticed our text says he sits because the refiner has to watch, has to watch very carefully that temperature, not just enough to get it boiling and working, but too much and it will ruin it. It will burn it all up. And as you watch, and it's interesting to watch, you can go online now and get all kinds of videos, but, but typically that solid form begins to melt and it forms that little bubble in that little crucible. And you can actually begin to see with the silver different impurities as they will come to the surface because they have a different burn point. And then whoosh, up in smoke they go. It is important that the refiner pay close attention to what is going on or the refiner will lose everything. You see, that's God's desire for us, to refine us. His eye is steadily on the work of purifying, making us holy. His wisdom and his love are focused as he sits and watches intently. I've never seen a refiner in person, but I have watched a glass blower, and very similar. They can only get that glass to just the right temperature, but they are intent. And I have watched them, and then they're oblivious to everything else around them as they work to create the right temperature. God's refining fire. Now, when we hear of God in this breath as fire, sometimes we think of sinners in the hands of an angry God. For some reason, this is the image that is stuck with us the most. We think of God standing there with a two-by-four in our lives, and as soon as we mess up, whap! We are ripped right out of life. But there's something Malachi wants us to know. In fact, all of Scripture wants to know. That's not how God works. Not everything unpleasant that happens to us is from God. Not everything that happens to us that is unpleasant or hurtful is from God. We have an old saying here in East Tennessee, maybe it's all over the place, it's just my cross to bear. Well, there is some bearing that has to occur. But let me remind you, I've been in this in life long enough to know that sometimes some of, the, some of the very unpleasant things that have happened in my life that are a struggle, that are not fun, have happened because another individual has made a bad decision or a hurtful decision, or they're just flat out mean. Anybody have a mean neighbor? Don't raise your hand. Anybody have a mean boss? I'm not going to ask if you have a mean spouse. I don't want to create problems here. Sometimes things happen from other people that impact our lives in a very hurtful and negative way, and it is a struggle. But that is not of God. Sometimes things happen in life. My brother got a disease, as I've been shared with you many a time, 24, and died. God cried when my brother died. Received him home. But God knew how much we were hurting. Not everything that happens is from God. But God can be in everything that happens to us to help us grow in life. There is nothing outside of God's ability to help us stay with and maintain. That's part of this image that Malachi is producing. God is watching intently in that crucible of life. And the heat is being turned up, but God is trying to do all that God can to make sure 
that that does not overwhelm us. But indeed, as we give our lives to God and we become and work at holiness, God helps us. Because in that process of refining, the only way, and I did hear this from my uncle, who did refine a little bit of gold and a little bit of silver. They're all out there. And he said, you know, the way you know that it's completely done is when that bubble of precious metal is completely clear so that you see your reflection in that bubble. Look it up, especially the silver. It's just like a mirror. When all the impurities are gone, you see, there is only one voice that can speak to us of identity. Let us make man in our, what did God say? Image. And that is what God is looking for in all of us. God is looking for God's image. And we have marred that up. We call it sin. We have made choices that are not of God, and God does not see God's own image, and yet all of these things that occur, if we will give our lives to God, God didn't cause it, everything, but God will work in everything to refine us and create in us, pull out that image. Because God continues to say to us, I know who you are, and of course, once you know who you are, then you know where you can stand and live and work and relate. But there's another image. Sometimes we lose this image in this passage. The refiner's fire, but the launderer's soap. The point is the same. Both refiner's fire and laundry soap exist to get rid of impurities. But the images are different. A refiner's fire is, is, is that strong image and burning things up and fire hurts from time to time. But laundry soap is close and personal. It touches me and my clothing to make me clean. A refiner's fire also is primarily, particularly in the culture of Malachi's day, a male image of industry and power and steel workers and we see all that. But laundry soap is primarily a female image. Household duties. Now we must be careful not to always put these male and female images there, but here they tend to work a little bit, especially in Malachi's day. And so Malachi seems to be suggesting that God is like also the mother washing the family's clothes. And she won't rest until everything is clean and fresh. Hers is a hands-on labor of love, working to make sure that those she cares enough about, she touches the dirt of their bodies and of their clothes and makes them presentable and clean to the world. So God is like, says Malachi, also a washerwoman, bent over, cleaning up, her family. You see, there's, there's an intimacy. And this is one of the ways where Malachi softens this God with a two-by-four image. Because one of the most gentle things I've ever witnessed in the world is a mother washing a, a baby. I remember my grandmother out on the back porch hand scrubbing clothes and then running them through that wringer and then taking them out. And typically she would start humming as she was hanging the clothes on those clotheslines. Malachi says God is working in our lives both ways, sometimes like a refiner's fire, and it hurts, but sometimes like a gentle wash. From our mother. We must be careful, of course, as we reflect on these two images and remember that God is one. There are not two gods, one strong, one tender, nor do we say that sometimes God is male and strong and sometimes God is female and tender. God's tenderness is God's strength. God's strength is God's tenderness. The two images come 
together. And Malachi simply wants us to know that what we do here matters, and it matters first to God. And that we must be careful in a complacent place where everything seems to be okay, we have the tendency not to bring God our best. In fact, he will say in just a few verses from where we stop, people, you are robbing me. That's what God says. He uses that image. He says, you are robbing me of what is mine. But we, he has work to do to refine and cleanse us for his purposes. For we, like our Judean ancestors, know this about ourselves. At times we too have stopped listening. Because we are beginning to believe that God is no longer relative to our daily living. And so we have no problem bringing him our leftovers. Malachi today speaks of God's judgment, but a judgment not driven by anger, but love. That is the deep truth that lies at the heart of this text. Our gracious God so loves us that God's greatest desire is to see us freed from the grime that covers our souls. God is not saying, I refuse to let you come into my house until you clean up a bit. No. God is used to having our messy selves around. Instead, God is saying, I'm going to help to clean you up. And in fact, we're getting into that, we're heading into that season where God comes. And we will continue to read the story of how God cleans us up. I love Cage Cove. Many of you know that. Many of you have been there. I hope you've been there some late afternoons when they turn the horses out. Some of you will know they have horse rides and the horses, they put saddles on them. And if you've ever ridden, those horses just enjoy that so much, not. I don't know if you've ever seen them, but I mean, they're like, yeah, okay. Sound like Eeyore. You know, you can just see them. The people get in the saddles and say, hey, here we go, okay. And they're just walking along and their heads are down and they stand there with that one leg sort of limp, you know, and... But when they turn, when they walk up, they take those saddles off, and they take the bridles out of their mouths, all those things that tie them down, and they open that gate. Anybody ever seen them? Man, they take off running and jumping and kicking and screaming, and they're going, yeah! I mean, you can't, you have to hear them in your heart, but that's what they're saying. I even saw one, I mean, he ran from the stables all the way down to the first creek, you know, the crossing there, where you go. Ran that far. I mean, he was way ahead of me. But by the time I got there, he was down on the ground and was rolling in the dust. And just, you know, and dust was coming up and jumped up and just... <laughs> you're well, That was free, by the way. You don't have to pay. You don't have to pay. <laughs> Why? Because they were free. All the stuff that saddled them down was taken off. And friends, that's what God desires for us today in our complacency, in our thinking, well, yeah, God, I'll give you what I have left over. It makes God mad. But rather than clubbing us with a two by four, God refines us in the fire, but he also gently, like a mother, washes us. God cares so deeply about you, and he wants you to care deeply about what he's doing. May we become those people. Father, we come today thanking you for refining us, for cleansing us, for not leaving us alone when difficult things come. We know that you too cry when there is injustice in our lives and when there are things that happen that are not from you, but you do not leave us alone. You will take even what others meant for our harm and you will turn it into good. If we will but come to you in worship and in study, in prayer and in meditation, all those things, God, that maybe we have sort of sloughed off is not important. 
So we thank you for being with us. And then, God, we ask for forgiveness indeed because we have sort of dropped you back from being center of our lives. We're pursuing careers and families and professions. We're pursuing, evidently, sometimes what culture tells us is important. All the while, we are losing our souls. But today, your word says to us, you desire to put our soul back into us that we might be a reflection of you. Help us this day, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We